So today we're going to be doing Keith Herring. Guy is just um, uh, an upbeat, playful, buoyant character, um, very generous spirit. Um, he is no longer with us. He died young um, of AIDS. Um, and one of the reasons that I was going ahead to do this program this month is, is he was gay and very much a part of the kind of gay liberation movement in, 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 the, in the 80s. Um, oh, is one, one other programming note. If you have any questions that come up during, during the presentation, you can use the chat function. So type, type it in. Um, okay, so Keith Herring, um, there's, there's a lot of sexual content in his work. I am not, this is the PG version. There'll be a little bit of reference to it, but um, I, you know, I, I'm kind of editing down to, to just go with um, his, his more, um, uh, tame work, comparatively speaking. Um, Keith Haring um, was part of that the group of graffiti artists. Now uh, we've been we've been around this for the past month or so uh, with Jean Michel Bastiat and and. Um, and the, the show up in Boston, which Keith Herring's work was included in also, the graffiti show that was up there. Um, and when I programmed this in, I had no idea that this show was coming up at the Fenimore Art Museum. Uh, I just found out a couple of weeks ago that this was happening and it just opened this week. As a matter of fact, I think it's opening officially this weekend. Um, and it will be on throughout the summer. It is in Cooperstown, New York, which if any of you are familiar, it's where the Baseball Hall of Fame is, believe it or not, but it's on a really beautiful lake. And I checked a little bit on, ho on motels and hotels and they're relatively reasonably priced up there. So it'd be a really fun day trip to just go up there, stay in a motel, go, go, to, the, go to see the show, uh, go for a swim in the lake and whatever else is available. And if you're into baseball, there it is, Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, so, okay, I'm going to move on to our guide. So, <clears throat> he was he was born in uh, in. Cootstown, actually, no, he wasn't born in Cootstown. He was born in Pennsylvania. They, he grew up in Cootstown, Pennsylvania, which is the heart of Amish country out there. Um, very small town. Um, let's see. Okay, and, and here's the Herring family from the 60s. You know, clean cut looking folks, um, fit right in out there. And um, Keith was kind of an odd bird from, from the get-go, I, I, would, I would have to say. Um, let's see. I'm going to do, I'm gonna do a, quick, a quick thing on, on his, on his full-out arc of his career. Um, you know, basically, he was um, kind of pop art, um, crossover into graffiti. Um, really came into New York City in the in the late '70s and became part of that kind of subculture. Um, his imagery is is really his own um, uh, language that he developed. Um, Herring's um, work had really a kind of meteoric um, uh, rise in, in, the, in the 80s. Um, he, he, 
he started doing these chalk drawings, and we'll talk a lot more about those as I get to them. But um, as I said, he was born, born in Kutztown. His father was an engineer and amateur cartoonist. So, you know, um, uh, I would say that Keith Herring's early influences are more Walt Disney and, and uh, Dr. Seuss than Rembrandt. Um, you know, Looney Tunes characters and Bugs Bunny. <laughs> Herring's family, you know, was very straight. They, they attended the United uh, Church of Christ or something like that. And um, in, in Keith's teenage years, he was kind of a part of the Jesus movement, which for a young gay man, that's questionable. That didn't last too long. Uh, um, when he graduated from uh, Kutztown High School, he went, he went to uh, Pittsburgh to study um, uh, commercial art and was there for a couple of years and then just decided that that wasn't for him, that he wanted to pursue the fine arts. So he transferred into the School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, so basically when he was, when he was in Pittsburgh, he began to see work by people like, uh, Jean de Buffet, who I think I've, I've shown you some of his, his work in the past, very primitive, um, uh, textured, you know, Jackson Pollock, uh, Tobey, um, and, there's, there's a fellow named Alachinsky. I'll show you some work from some of these people later on. But you can see on the, on the right, this, this image, this Kandinsky Mondrian lobotomy. Uh, <laughs> uh, th this guy had quite a sense of humor. Um, and that, that's, that's quite important. So, um, here, here is, you know, this is early work. This was work that was done at, at when he was at v, uh, SVA. Um, and, you know, on the lower right hand corner is a, is a piece from Lee Krasner. And it's this kind of field of marking, you know, this kind of calligraphic business that was going on with the abstract expressionists. Well, this piece uh, on the top is, is chalk on paper by uh, Keith Herring. And if I, if I actually zoom in a little bit, you might be able to see a little bit more clearly that these are a bunch of penises. <laughs> so um, young Keith um, came into New York City to party. Uh, okay. He also, while attending the School of Visual Arts, saw the vitality of the graffiti artists and, and saw this as a new direction because he really felt an affinity to the kind of um, uh, Saturday morning cartoon aspect of, of, of what these graffiti artists were all about. And then there's also the scale and the speed with which these guys were making these pieces. So, this was very much an influence. He, he, he was looking at this stuff and, you know, seeing the city as a canvas. You know, this is the late seventies. The city was a mess. There were deteriorating buildings everywhere. There was, you know, it was, it was, it was a disaster area. If any of you were around at the time, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and you know these these guys, you know, just had had kind of free reign to use buildings and use the subways as as their as their um, their canvas. Okay, so this piece on the on the left is a Keith Herring piece from 1979 and. On the, on the right is uh, Pierre Alachinsky. Uh, he had a, um, a museum show that, that Herring saw out in Pittsburgh and that really affected him profoundly. And you can see it in, in, this, in this piece. Um, okay. 
And again, there are a number of different influences that, that um, come into play when, when we're talking about this. A range of sources for the imagery, the pop culture, the, the um, um, high art stuff, Alchinsky, Pollock, performance art, okay? And, and I'm gonna go deeper into this as we, as we move along, but th there's also this ab Aborigine, you know, um, uh, kind of animated line that, that, you know, Keith tuned into. The other piece of the picture that, that I really wanna draw your attention to is, is the fact that, you know, he had a social and political bent. You know, the, the idea of this puppet master TV, you know, controlling our thoughts and our, our reactions to things, you know, getting us to go out and buy stuff and all that. He was a sly character, this Keith. <laughs> Okay, and, and here's young Keith right here. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that look on his face, it didn't change that much when he got to be a, a bit older. Um, the kid from Kutztown. <laughs> so, you know, he had been doing this cartooning business since, since his childhood. He just expanded the scale of it when, when he got into these pieces and, and, and began to create his own worlds. Um, okay. And now we're gonna go into the subway drums. What happened was Keith saw all the graffiti stuff and you know those were all done with spray paint and with markers and stuff like that. He really didn't want to appropriate that, you know, this white kid from Kutztown. Uh, <laughs> he didn't want to appropriate the, the spray paint thing. And on the, um, the advertising placards in the subways, between having um, a, you know, having the space rented out they would put these black placards in there. And he was on the subway one day and he noticed these things. And he immediately thought, oh, here it is. And he went upstairs onto the street, bought himself a box of chalk and went at it. And he did literally hundreds of these. He would go day after day, getting off and getting back onto the train and get out there and do these signature drawings on, on these, these black placards. Um, and he would go up and down, you know, throughout Manhattan, over into, over into Brooklyn. I don't know if any of you remember this, but I do remember seeing these things when, when I was, one, you know, in the, in the 70s, early 80s. Um, <clears throat> riding around. So he had a, um, <clears throat> he had an art following basically from this. He really, it really, people began to, you know, notice this. And it started in 79 and, you know, went on through the early 80s where he would just hop off and, and zap out one of these drawings. Um, very spontaneous. <clears throat> he didn't go back and, you know, smudge anything out or try and erase anything. It was really, you know, a very spontaneous flow. Uh, fast and done. Back on the train. Um, so... Now, the other thing that he was influenced by was the scale of the graffiti writers. I mean, you know, these guys were doing these enormous things. This, you know, five points thing is like, you know, it's almost a story high, these letters. Um, the, 
the scale of the marking and the scale of the piece was very much part of what made them powerful. Um, so again, <clears throat> city as canvas. All right. Um, so Keith was going to um, the School of Visual Arts and, and He's, go, he's going in, into, the, into the school and he meets this young black man outside. This is 1978 or something like that. And, and the guy says to him, you know, could you walk me in past the security guards? Because I, you know, really like to get in. And he said, sure, come on with me. And Keith brings him in and, and uh, Keith goes off to class. And when he comes out of class, there are the same old tags, which is which is Jean Michel Biscat's signature, and there are these sayings all over the inside. And he knew then that he had just met Samo. <laughs> so um, years years later, um, by 1982 they were both rising stars in the art world. Um, you know, the, those, um, those subway drawings really made a reputation for Keith and he had uh, shows at a gallery called the Fun Gallery and there were some other galleries that, that were showing his work. Um, and Jean-Michel was also, you know, he was, he was a, he was a, Rising Star by 82. Um, they were fetching fancy prices for their work. Um, they saw each other um, quite a bit. Now, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is this, this crown thing. This is something that's a symbol in Jean-Michel Biscout's work a lot. And notice the crown that, that, uh, that Keith is wearing. Um, you know, this is a, um, a friendship that really developed <clears throat> over time. And they were, you know, they were part of the Warhol gang hanging out in the, in the, in the clubs and stuff like that. Okay. So these, these pieces are really um, very spontaneous. Um, this is, you know, basically what, what Keith would do is start in one corner and paint his way across the thing and just keep painting. And there's no going back. He didn't stop. He didn't, you know, revise. It's, it's really very much a kind of trance state that he goes into. There's no corrections. There's no going back. There's no beforehand sketch. He just dives into the thing. And again, this is part of that, that performance business that, that Jackson Pollock was into with, with his splatter paintings. It's really that spontaneity, that, that, that um, presence of mind and presence in the act of creating this thing. And for, for Keith, it really was um, the act of creating the painting that was as much a, a work of art as the painting that came out of it. Um, I, can, I can tell you, this is, this is a very, you know, he was very skilled at this. This is a really, diff this is not easy. <laughs> and again, you know, marker, ink, acrylic on, on found canvas, big, you know, 86 by 86, very generous scale. Um, you know, and then there's these characters that are in there, these, this kind of dog person, this, this, this whole kind of 
narrative that's starting to emerge out of these wacky, buoyant marks that he's creating. Um, very energetic, very much, you know, the dance. They're, they're all part of the, you know, the, the character's dance and the, the process of creating the thing as a dance. And, you know, again, you know, this wacky kind of sci-fi, enigmatic narrative, um, uh, a riddle with no key, <laughs> no key code. <laughs> and this is Keith's first mural that, that I know of, his large scale, his first large scale mural outdoors. Um, you know, he did mur mural sized pieces inside on canvas, but this, this is the first one that he did out of doors. This was um, uh, housed in a dowry. It's no longer there, but, but um, it was very, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of the graffiti writers love this piece. Um, you know, the, the interest Yes. Somebody had a comment. Yes. Uh, saying his spontaneity of line drawing reminds me of all people of Matisse. Uh, reminds me of all people of Matisse. Well, there there is that aspect of Matisse's Matisse's uh, you know portraits and line drawings. There's there is that spontaneity in in them. Although although. Uh, Matisse didn't didn't climb inside his uh, his canvases quite quite as much as Keith did. Uh, in, in fact, Keith used to paint himself into the corner when he was painting one of these pieces. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, again, looking at the imagery on on this piece, it's you know when I was doing this, I. I, it, it brought me back to that time and thinking about how, you know, the, the nuclear threat was still there. It was like, you know, this is the early 80s. It was still, we were, you know, we were scratching our heads. I mean, there was still the Soviet Union and, 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 and all that stuff and the possibility of, of nuclear annihilation. Plus, you know, Three Mile Island had happened by then. There's a, there, there was a lot of question about what radiation uh, could do to us. And, you know, on the one hand, it looks like a bunch of running people. On the other hand, they're dancing their way through it. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the three-eyed mutant clown. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're interesting pieces. <laughs> And here is uh, Kenny Scharf. Ke Kenny Scharf was um, uh, one of um, his classmates. And, um, you know, basically he was also influenced by the street art. And, um, uh, you know, they were all in the process of taking this street art into the fine art world, you know. The business of Warhol and breaking down the, the, the layers between pop and fine art was something which was really, you know, very much on the forefront with these guys. Um, yeah, Kenny, Kenny Scharf was a very good friend of, of, um, of Keith Haring. And, you know, this other, other painters, Elizabeth Murray, um, uh, the neo-expressionist uh, George Bazlitz, um, uh, Sandro Chia and, and Julian Schnabel all had that kind of street grit aspect to their work. Um, so, you know, it was something that was going on in the 80s. And, and it, was a, it was a turn away from the kind of cleanliness of pop art. And, and um, although not all of them were clean, I mean, Rauschenberg definitely fit in there. But but it, it basically is turn, a turn away from minimalism and that kind of cerebral, uh, uh, esoteric direction that high art was going in. 
for a long period of time. So this is much more street. It's much more accessible. You know, they may be wacky images, but they're definitely things that you can, you know, you, you recognize there's something going on here uh, in, this, in this clown car. <laughs> okay, and again, references to the Aboriginal art, to, to, to Greek line drawing and all that stuff. Keith was pulling in a lot of different sources in, into his work. Um, and um, here he is on, on the left with his, with his first long-term boyfriend, though, though they, they didn't last all that long. I mean, they were, they were partying all the time in the, in the clubs. So there was a, a lot of uh, uh, change, changing partners, shall we say. At that time, AIDS was not as big a concern as it, as it became. You know, this is the early 80s. And, and although it, the epidemic had already begun, it was not as widespread as it became by 84, 86, where uh, it was just devastating. Um, and, and in fact, his, his boyfriend did die of AIDS before um, uh, Keith did. And again, you know, where is he getting this imagery? This dog-headed man. You know, there's there's this piece which was which was from an archaeological dig in the steppes of of, of Russia, um, and you know these mythological characters. Now, I, I don't know. I doubt that Keith saw the dog the dog man, but but uh, what I'm saying is is as far as kind of reaching into mythological elements and pulling them out and bringing them up into our pop uh, vernacular, he was there. Okay. And the dancing. Okay, like I said, the clubs. He was in there with Madonna. He was out there, you know, dancing away with with Warhol and the gang, Grace Jones, um, and and these pieces. Actually, this was um, uh, Woodhull Medical and Mental Health Center in Bedford Stuyvesant. Keith was big money now. He was he was bringing in you know a hundred k for a painting. Um, the you know, and at that time, that was a lot of money. It's nothing compared to what's going on now, but it was a lot of money. He would do these um, murals um, for free. He would go in and, and you know, in places where um, basically uh, they, they basically couldn't afford to pay him. But, you know, he would, he would go into medical centers, into boys clubs, into different, you know, um, uh, socially functioning institutions and, and give these, these murals to them, which is really fabulous. And again, we got the dancing thing. Um, you know, the club, the club aspect was a huge thing, you know, and this is located and it still is located outside uh, the, the park at uh, 17 State Street. This yellow and red aluminum sculpture showcases Herring's signature style and energy in three dimensional form. A, a larger than life pair of dancing interlocked uh, interlocks arms and uh, kicking kicking their legs in bold, lively caper, um, hopefully uh, bringing a bit of levity to uh, the lawyers that uh, are in the building. <laughs> um, Larry? Yes. Somebody had a comment that kinetic energy here is almost a visual counterpart. Yes. Dancing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that brings me to brings me to another another piece of the picture, which is which is basically, you know, 
in in those clubs, they be they the dance scene. It was it was drug, sex, and rock and roll. There was energy abounding, and they were like taking psychedelics and and all that stuff. So a lot of those those um, energy markings that are flying off of his off of his pieces are kind of like you know it's that it's that um, reverberation from that from that uh, that psychedelic high uh, <laughs> oh and here we go Keith with Andy in in 1985 now now Andy Warhol was you know somebody that 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 Scott and and Keith looked to a lot of the a lot of the young artists looked to as a as a model in certain ways um, Keith really um, uh, took in Andy's attitude toward the business of art and basically creating art that was at different levels. Um, and so what he did in 1985-86 was create the pop shop on Lafayette Street. And basically it ran until, I guess it was in the... 2000, I think it might have even been going in, in uh, out to 2010. I'm not 100% sure when they when they closed it. But what he did was open up this pop shop because not everybody could afford 100k to to go home with a with a um, a Keith Herring, but they could afford a button, they could afford a, a T-shirt, and and he was definitely always breaking down the barriers between the, the highfalutin art world and the pop world and the popular culture. And he wanted to stay in touch with that. So one part of what brought him to opening up the pop shop was he wanted to reach out to those people that, that you know, he had the spray cans in their hands. Uh, and, and so that, that is an aspect of what's going on here. The other thing was he was very generous. He was a very generous guy and he gave back to the community. He supported um, AIDS research and AIDS clinics, um, uh, was very much involved in anti-apartheid and did posters for that, um, was really aware of you know the the social inequities and and directly you know engaged that in his work and wanted to remain part of that that remained part of his of his how he was operating okay and here's keith himself in the pop shop <laughs> and uh, on the on the right is Grace Jones, body painted by Keith in in uh, uh, 1986. This was actually the this series of photographs was taken by uh, Maplethorpe, who was another name that you may or may not know, but he he was a um, terrific photographer and and did this whole series from Grace Jones and actually um, Keith uh, body painted another really wonderful dancer um, and I'm spacing out his name now, but Maplethorpe did a whole series of shots of that dancer also. While you're thinking, Larry, somebody yes. asked, what is the symbolism of the baby? Ah, glad you asked that. I didn't. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> yes, basically the symbolism of the baby, th this was like right from the get-go. He started out with the radiant child as one of his, as one of his tags when he was, when he was doing, doing the subway stuff. And he would find really odd and unique places to put that little radiant child. And what, what he felt that symbolized for him was innocence, exuberance, energy, the energy of life, the life force, that innocence. 
that's something that 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 he really valued and and you know that business of the spontaneous that business of the of the of the vitality of the newborn um that's something that 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 was very important and 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 i'm really glad you asked that question thank you uh, <laughs> so if i only made paintings in a gallery i would probably be frustrated <laughs> Another comment, Larry. Yes. Um, somebody said, like the Zen uh, notion of beginner's mind. Yes, very much like that. And 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 that's that is the, you know, he would paint these things with Devo with music playing, and and he he lay down the strokes in rhythm with the music. You know, just a remarkable fellow. I love the guy at this at this stage at this stage of the game. If you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, you, you couldn't put anything in front of him that he wouldn't put a mark on. So here's, here's a set of skateboards that he, that he, uh, he drew, drew up with markers and, you know, these wonderful sculptures that, you know, they, they actually appear, they're, they're, they're all, over, all over the place now, all over the planet. Um, let's see. Ah, and here's here is um, for the Lower East Side Boys Club, um, and you know this is one of the pieces where he must have done tracings because the the abstract shapes that are in the background for the interior and the exterior are so close to each other, you know. So that he must have really, you know transferred that that drawing the the big drawing shapes before painting but it's it's a really fabulous and again this is this was a gift he gave to the boys club you know 1987 the guy was really busy at that point and this is one that i wanted to let you see in relationship to keith's work ferdinand Liget was a wonderful cubist painter and did these large scale um, semi-abstract pieces. And you can see very much the, the you know, modeling that, that um, Keith took from these, especially in his large scale murals. Okay. And again, the Wood Hill Medical Center, these big, beautiful, buoyant abstract shapes with the, with the figures dancing through. Um, what a wonderful place to be. Um, and crack is whack. This, this piece he went out and did in, in 1986. He did not have um, uh, city permission to do this. He went out and just did it. Um, it's, it's at the, you know, Harlem River Drive, and, and you can actually still see it out there. Um, it was um, basically, uh, let's see, what happened? He, um, yeah, he didn't, have, he didn't have permission to paint it, so he was actually arrested, and they, they find him, I don't know, you know, 75 bucks or something like that. Um, and now this is officially the crack is whack playground. It is maintained by the city of New York. They have come back and repainted the painting, you know, basically a, a hired artist to, to come back and restore it when it, when it wore out because it's outdoors. So it, it does tend to wear down. Um, Again, these large scale pieces, big abstract shapes. He did well over 50 um, uh, mur large scale mural projects. And you know, this is 1987. Um, he was not diagnosed with AIDS until 
I think the beginning of 1989. Um, fabulous, beautiful, you know, energy in these pieces, 60 by 60, big buoyant canvases. He was showing with, um, with Tony Shafrazi, who was a, another story. Anyway, Tony Shafrazi was an um, art dealer. Um, uh, I, believe, I believe his gallery was down in Soho, but it may have been, it may have been in, um, in, the, in the village. Anyway, Shafrazi made his bones uh, by going in and painting an anti-war, taking a spray, uh, can of spray paint and, anti, and, and painting an anti-war uh, um, uh, slogan on Guernica in the Museum of Modern Art. Thank God they, they could take the, the stuff off. But Shafrazi was quite a character and he, he actually um, showed uh, Keith Haring and, and a number of other, uh, you know, basically he also worked with Kenny Sharp and a number of other young kind of graffiti derived artists at that, at that time. Larry? Yeah. Um, somebody asked if he did all the paintings alone for yes. these huge works or did he have help? He, he did his paintings alone. He did collaborate on some mural projects where he would paint some things in, lay out the, the composition and have, have kids come in and work with him on, on the murals. Um, for the most part, his paintings were his thing. Uh, the fabrications on the other hand, that's a whole other ball game. You know, the, the, these uh, stainless steel and aluminum pieces he would have fabricated, but, but those were his shapes and all that. Now, for, for the most part, you know, his handprint was very important to a lot of these paintings. Though, though I, will, I will retract that statement later on uh, in, 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 in a couple of circumstances. But these are these are some of the posters that 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 uh, that he was working on. Um, you know, the stop AIDS, uh, very big campaign, um, free South Africa. You know, at the time, this was this was a you know he he did a lot of imagery around this around the the um, the apartheid issues. And, and also he, he dealt with the, the black, white, um, of the, the young graffiti artist who was beaten to death that had a profound effect on him also. And did a lot of imagery with, uh, with policemen with nightsticks beating people up. Um, so, you know, that aspect, that, that political, social consciousness was always there. And again, silence equals death. By this time, Keith was, was you know, diagnosed by 1989. So these pieces are, are really poignant. Um, and again, this business, you know, there's, there's also the, the business about about money and 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 um, and the the class structure and stuff like that 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 he dealt with throughout his career and one of the things about the pop shop was a healthy disrespect for commercialization and participating in commercialization to use the money for social causes really interesting guy okay and and here again is where i'm going to take back the 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 idea that he did he did all the line work himself on the on the right in the lower the lower corner you can see um uh keith painting but he's painting out in this this barrio area that was drug infested and notorious for you know basically 
it was it was very a very dangerous area. There were a lot of people with AIDS. There was all kinds of stuff going on there, and he painted this in a, in a spot where it was deteriorating very quickly. So what they what they did from the contemporary museum in Barcelona was go and take a tracing from the entire mural that he had created down in that spot and transferred it to this wall that's down below the, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona. Really interesting. And, you know, by that time, Keith was gone. So this piece was a homage. And this was donated to Herring's hometown Kutztown, PA, by Keith Her the Keith Herring Foundation and Tony Shabrazi Gallery in 1992, and it still exists there. There's a, there is a campus of um, uh, the Pennsylvania University in Kutztown, um, so it isn't it isn't like it's 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 all farmers out there, um, but he definitely was somebody who uh, was one of their one of their famous, their famous sons. <laughs> okay, and this, this is in Amsterdam. This actually was the first museum to give Keith Herring a, uh, a retrospective, a large scale museum show. Um, it, it didn't happen in the US until much later in, in in, in his life, he was included in a number of shows like the Whitney Biannual and, and, and all of that and into group shows. But this was the first museum to give him a show in the 80s. And he did this mural on, on the side of it. Okay, and you know, this, this is a very famous image, ignorance equals fear. Silence equals death. Okay, this cast bronze triptych is the very special one. It, it was the last artwork Harry made before his death at age 31 due to AIDS related complications. Though he had never worked in play before, Herring used a loop knife to carve his lines, his line drawing out of the clay slabs, which were then cast and turned into an edition of nine. Herring's friend, Sam uh, Havertoy, was once quoted as saying, the images came directly from his head. He never stopped to rethink a line. He never edited himself. He never made corrections. The lines he carved in the clay were seamless and flawless. And this piece is at St. John the Divine. Larry, we have another comment. Sure. The Barcelona mural is reminiscent of some Mesoamerican reliefs. Absolutely. Too. And and I, I was going to include <laughs> one of those, but I ran out of time. Good point. And yes, it is. Absolutely. And it has all of that, um, that darkness in it. You know, there, there is a dark aspect to this. There's those needles. There's that, that snake, the devouring snake. Um, you know, there's even, if you look at the tail, there's a condom on the tail. <laughs> This is, it's, you know, it is that dark mystical aspect in this piece, that kind of Mesoamerican aspect. Yes, good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I thought about it and just never got to that, that getting that reference. <laughs> okay. Very poignant, very beautiful. And here we are. Before um, you continue. Yes. Somebody asks, um, what does the text say? It's in Spanish. Do you know? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so this Radiant Vision exhibition is on at the Fenimore Art Museum throughout the summer. Uh, sounds like it's, I, I, I'm, I'm tempted. It's, it might be worth a, worth a, a day trip. Um, so there's, there's two documentaries that I recommend. The Keith Herring uh, Street Art Boy, um, uh, American Masters PBS. It's, it's on, actually it expires 616. So this month on the 16th, it won't be free on the internet, but right now you can, you can actually just go on and, and uh, Google search it and you can play it on, on, you know, basically for free on your, on your computer. Also, if you have Roku, it's on the PBS channel and you can go in to their um, uh, American Masters series and, and actually watch it there. Um, definitely worth watching, you know, of course, PBS, they always do quality stuff. And then there's this other documentary, which has some really good shots of Keith painting. Um, and you get the real sense of the downtown scene in, in, that, in that documentary. It's, it's got French subtitles, but the, 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 uh, the voiceover and the, and the talk is in English. So, you know, you just kind of ignore the, the, um, the French text at the bottom, unless you can read French, then, <laughs> then you'd be getting an extra treat. Um, this piece, uh, this elephant on the, on the, on the right is, um, is a paper mache piece. It's, all, it's only about five feet tall. Comparatively speaking, it's relatively small, but you know, it's just so zany. I love the guy. <laughs> I think we all got that. Yeah. Asked, did he ever have females in his images? Uh, um, Grace Jones. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yes, he, he did have some, but for the most part, he was really into boys. <laughs> Understandable. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, this was a treat, if ever there was one. Yeah. Um, another excellent presentation. And we thank you for all the comments. Uh, you could always write to the director if you've enjoyed this series. Um, I'm sure they, he'd be interested in hearing. Uh, the director's name is Andrew Farber. So um, I thank you all for coming. And as you know, this is going to continue. So oh, we'll yeah. See you again next, next, week. next week is Dia. <laughs> right. Dia and Bacon, right? Yep. Beacon. Right. Beacon. Yep. Um, and so thank you all. Don't forget all our programs are on our website. They're archived and uh, you could register for any program that's going to be coming up at chappaqualibrary.org. Don't forget tomorrow, if you're interested in this solar eclipse, please uh, register at for the two o'clock program with meteorologist Joe Rayo. So uh, any other questions? Let me see. I think I just saw maybe something just came up. Just thank yous and, um, and thank you for continuing the series. So have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Okay. All right, bye everyone. Bye. Larry, I'm gonna stay on for a minute and see. Okay, what, um, sure. We could do what we tried yep. so many times, but <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's hard people. I know when you have that iPad, it's yeah, it's hard to figure out how the heck to turn the darn thing off. The way to do it. Uh, will the Rayo program be recorded? Um, it's it will be recorded. Uh, most of our programs are recorded. The one with Daniel Silva will not be recorded. I probably should have mentioned that. Mm. Um, but this one will be. So when is the actual eclipse taking place? It's on the tenth of June. The tenth. And I don't know what time Joe Rayo will tell us that. I think the okay. times have been uh, changing for some reason, but huh. I, way beyond me. So, okay. Meanwhile, I love this elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Any <Isn't he> cute? <laughs> Absolutely. I can understand why you love it. It goes with uh, Nikki. Uh, yes, the Sun Fall, oh, sure. Right, same sort of thing. As a matter of fact, uh, I forgot to mention that they were friends, they knew each other. It? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, somebody just mentioned thank you for recording most of your programs. Yeah. Uh, they can't always watch it in live. And we understand that and respect yeah. that. And that's why we, we record all the programs. We have quite an archived uh, library. 
So I'm glad you could see it, especially if it's kind of day like tomorrow when it's so sunny in the 90s, you might not want to go out. You could see so many programs we have at the library. Just go to our website and scroll down. Another person loved your uh, elephant too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that elephant. Five feet tall? Sure, I could yeah, find it. Yeah, yeah not, not too big, <laughs> comparatively speaking. <laughs> Well, I think we're running into the same program. Yeah, I guess we're stuck. Okay. All right. Um, bye, everybody. Oh, it's at exhibit. Is there an exhibit for the elephant? Uh, I don't think that's in, in the show that's up, the, up in uh, Fenimore. Okay. All right. Okay, Larry, I will see you on Monday. At work. Okay. Yep. Bye, Be everyone. Back. Okay.